Okay, let's talk next about one of the enemies uh, to an instrument pilot, and that is ice. Ice is never a good thing, and you can get structural ice, aircraft structural ice, if two conditions are true. One, you have visible moisture, meaning you have a cloud, a cumulus cloud, a stratiform cloud, fog, it can be any type of visible moisture. You have to have that first and foremost. Secondly, the temperature has to be freezing zero degrees Celsius or lower. In other words, as an instrument pilot, if you're flying in IMC conditions, you're in the clouds, and you know the temperature is freezing or below, you need to be on the watch for icing, for structural icing. So temperature is something you need to be acutely aware of when you're in IMC. Of course, you'd be looking beforehand for those temperatures aloft, pie reps, air mitts, do all of your homework, in other words, before you go flying. But as you're flying, you're looking at that temperature. You're looking out over the leading edge of the wing. You're looking at the wing strut if you're in a Cessna high wing aircraft or maybe the outside air temperature probe if you're in a low wing Piper aircraft. There's a lot of things to consider when it comes to icing for pilots. But this is some basic knowledge that you need to have. Clear ice can form when the water droplets are larger. It kind of hits the skin of the aircraft and it kind of flows and gradually freezes. It's more clear and hard and sheet-like, and it's one of the hardest to get rid of. Rime ice forms when the water droplets are smaller, like in stratiform clouds or, or light drizzle. The smaller frozen droplets kind of trap air between them, and they give kind of a, a, a more white, opaque appearance, kind of a rougher, icy type of uh, appearance. Um, it's also lighter in weight than uh, clear ice, because it's got a little more air in it, but it's also more irregular in shape and more rough kind of in the surface. So it has a little more aerodynamic issues with it, reducing lift and, and increasing drag even more than, than the clear ice. However, it is more brittle than clear ice and it can be broken up or busted apart, especially if there's anti-ice equipment on the airplane. Most of the light aircraft don't have such things like a hot wing, that's a wing that's heated. We have a pitot tube that's heated, and we can turn on the pitot heat and need to turn on the pitot heat first thing. But in a small aircraft, we don't have a hot wing or we don't have de-ice boots, which inflate and deflate, kind of cracking the ice and breaking it up and the wind just kind of carrying it off into the airstream. And then there's mixed ice, which can be a combination of both uh, clear and rime, mainly from a mixture of smaller and larger uh, water droplets. That would create more of a, a mixed ice. Again, besides doing your pre-flight homework and being very conservative with the go-no-go no go decision or your route of flight or your altitudes, your cruising altitudes, these are all things to consider. When you're in the clouds in IMC, you want to be checking your temperature. You want to be looking out on the aircraft structure to be checking for ice buildup, a potential. And at the first sign of it, you want to take action. That's probably the most important things. Early recognition and then quick, decisive reaction. What can you do? You can let ATC know that you're picking up ice. You can decrease your altitude more than likely. Usually going down will find you warmer temperatures, but it depends at what temperature you're already at and how far you'd have to go down and where the terrain is. So there's a lot of considerations. Um, sometimes the quickest way may be up, especially if you know you're at the top of the clouds or near the top of the clouds. You might be able to climb out of the IMC. However, keep in mind if you're already high up in a light aircraft and you're picking up ice, which is decreasing your lift, decreasing your thrust, increasing your drag, and increasing the weight of the airplane, performance is going down. So again, that's why it's so important to really respect this at a high level, avoid this, take the most conservative actions in your flight planning, and sometimes if you don't change your altitude, you might want to change your course. Even a 180 may be able to get out of that ice if you weren't picking it up five or ten minutes ago. You might want to go back to where you weren't picking it up change your route, change your altitude, get to an alternate if you need to, any of those type of things. As I said, one of the first things to do as well is flip the pitot heat on. Anytime, even if you don't have structural ice, you don't see any, if you're in temperatures that are conducive for that, if you're an IMC, I think it's a good general rule of thumb in colder weather, even if you're not at freezing, but you're in IMC, have a procedure of flipping on the pitot heat just as a precaution. You don't want to lose your airspeed indication. Your flight instructor is going to have a lot more tips and techniques for you to be knowledgeable about ice and how to deal with it uh, as a pilot. I like to try to give as much tips and knowledge beyond the written test uh, in this course, but I still have to focus mostly on the written knowledge portion.
Another thing to be aware of is the potential for induction ice, meaning you have a buildup of an ice layer over the air induction point or the air filter, for which if you're in a carbureted aircraft, you could pull carb heat on and then you're sourcing the air from inside the engine area or if you have an alternate air, things like that. Then you have intensity designators. You can see there trace, light, moderate, or severe. You can look these up. Uh, trace is where ice is just becoming perceptible. It's just a little amount. It's not necessarily hazardous unless you keep staying in it and you are for over an extended period of time accumulating, accumulating, accumulating. Generally, the, the FAA says for over an hour, if you're exposed at a trace level, then that could be very much a problem. I would say this, at the first sign of ice, you take action. So even at a trace amount, you're making a change as if there's sort of an emergency. Again, this is for aircraft that do not have anti-ice or de-ice equipment. Then light is a rate of accumulation that is going to become a problem if, if the flight is prolonged. It's a perfect use if you have de-icing or anti-icing equipment on board to, to use it occasionally. You can deal with light icing pretty well. Moderate means there's an accumulation that even just a short amount of time produces a potentially hazardous situation. Now we're into the moderate and the use of de-icing, anti-icing is really necessary. And severe, well that's just not good. <laughs> even, uh, even the anti-icing, de-icing equipment is going to fail to help in that scenario. So that's some knowledge and some considerations with uh, aircraft icing. Other icing issues, freezing rain, one of the greatest accumulation rates of ice. Not good. If you hear any reports or pyreps, freezing rain goes on as a liquid. It freezes on contact and it covers a large amount of the aircraft skin and so there is high accumulation rates. However, freezing rain usually indicates temperatures above you are going to be above freezing at some higher altitude meaning air temperature is warmer above you, rain is falling, and as it's falling, it's getting into colder and colder air, which is opposite of what's normal. So they're basically supercooled rain droplets, which again, high accumulation rate for something like that. Ice pellets are not like freezing rain. They're already frozen. They hit you as frozen pellets, meaning that rain is actually freezing at a higher altitude above you, which might indicate that freezing rain actually exists above you. Um, and then snow indicates temperatures are above freezing at your altitude. Believe it or not, snow is not what we want either. It's not good, but it's better than ice pellets. It's better than freezing rain. And it indicates that your temperatures are above freezing at the altitude that you are at. Softer, wetter, and more air. Easier to hopefully come off as well. But again, any type of ice, including trace amounts, act now. Frost is something that you would notice on a pre-flight early morning. Is that no big deal? I mean, it's on our cars, right? Yeah, you get your little scraper out and you scrape the windshield a little bit and hop in, start the engine and go. Not with an airplane. It's tempting to want to do that, but it also is an aerodynamic problem for us because it disrupts the airflow over the wings, causes early separation of the airflow. Interestingly, you can see this note here, frost uh, like a sandpaper thickness reduces our lift by 30% and can increase our drag by 40%. That's just a sandpaper thick layer of frost over the wings and airframe can do that and reduce our performance. So yeah, you don't want to do that. You want to put that aircraft into the sun, let the sun bake on the wings. If it's softening up a little bit, some people can brush it. Some people use water, warm water. Problem is that if you're still at really freezing temperatures, you go flying and some of that water that hasn't come off yet can kind of refreeze. 